about the incarnate birth of Jesus. What a wonderful time this is in history. It changed everything from B.C. to A.D. Time was changed when he was born. The incarnation of Jesus was prophesied by Isaiah and fulfilled in the Gospel messages, which we want to look at here today. The sign of God's love for us is that He sent His one and only begotten Son, Jesus, to us so that we could be saved and not condemned. And so we're going to be looking at God's love in action as He's being born of Mary, a virgin. Let's look at that over in Isaiah 7.14. That the mother of Jesus would need to be a virgin. In Isaiah 7.14 it says, Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign it's interesting when the Lord gives us a sign how specific He is. And it's got to be fulfilled in that exact way. The sign is this. The virgin will conceive. Now that's a miracle. And give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. So, the son to be born was going to be God. Would be fully God and yet fully man. Now that's a miracle as well. So we see all the miracles that God does in showing us how much He loves us. It's just amazing when we understand the completeness and thoroughness of God's love expressed to us His creation, those who are created in His very image. Then in Isaiah 9 we see another prophecy concerning the child Jesus and what He would be. He would be the King of kings and Lord of lords. Isaiah 9, beginning in verse 6. For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So you see all the many names that Jesus has, because again he was fully God and fully man. In verse 7, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end, because there's still the world to come where His kingdom will be throughout the whole of the world and all of the universe. He will reign on David's throne and over His kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So, as soon as Jesus was born, He was the King. He was the Lord. He was also our Savior. Hallelujah! What a wonderful combination of the incarnation of Jesus. This is God's love given to us. See, the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. This isn't something that men and women can do. This is something only the Lord can do. Only the Lord can save us from sin, and He has through His Son, Jesus. So, the actual fulfillment of the prophecy is over here with Mary and Joseph. And uh, so if we can turn to Luke the first chapter we see how the angel comes to uh, to Mary Luke 1 and verse 26 in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy and that is uh, where John the Baptist was he was in the, the womb of Elizabeth uh, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth a town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. And historians figure that Mary was probably 15 in that age range, so she was a young woman. Uh, and that was, I'm sure, very disturbing to her to hear that from an angel. The Lord is with you. I don't know whether that calmed her right away or not, but I'm sure that the angel was trying to help her understand there's nothing to be afraid of here. In verse 29, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Indeed. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Thankfully, angels tell us that. If it were to come to us, they'd say, Don't be afraid. I'm coming from the Lord, are coming from God. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. 
the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Okay, so once it started at his birth, it's still going on today. See, we're the ambassadors of that kingdom of Jesus today. The kingdom of light on the earth. We represent that kingdom on the earth today. Verse 34, how will this be? A very good question, Mary. Mary asked the angel that, since I am a virgin. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. And we need to be encouraged by that truth. In verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. Well, then there was Joseph. What was he going to do? He was an older man. What was he going to do having his bride or his uh, theos bride, I should say, be with child? Was he going to put her away quietly? How was he going to handle that news? So the angel had to come to Joseph too. And he had to encourage Joseph that this was of God, not of man. Verse 18 of Matthew 1, it says this. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And of course, you know what the tradition would have been as far as naming a a son would be after the family's name in some way or the other. So being given the name of Jesus, that was a God name that this young baby was going to have given to him. In verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Hallelujah. So everybody was on the same page now. Mary and Joseph, the two primary people to carry out the birth of Jesus being born in a manger in Bethlehem. What a wonderful thing. How beautiful can that be? Certainly the shepherds were overjoyed with joy because that was happening right there in their town. We can be happy and blessed that Jesus has done this for the whole world. He's happening and it's happened in our hearts, those who believe. And it's called the second birth. But we are the ones who have received the blessing of Jesus coming. But as John says, he came from a place that would have surprised everybody. And so in John 1, John tells us this about Jesus' birth. John 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So before Jesus was born, he was the Word. It's the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And after this happened, it was the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Because the Word was going to become Jesus. In verse 2, He was with God in the beginning, and through Him all things were made. So He was the Creator of everything. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. 
the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it, nor can the darkness overcome it. That's why we who are the light today in Jesus have to be the light and not be afraid of the darkness. In verse 14, it continues. Verse 14, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. That Jesus came to identify with man, His creation, man and woman, His creation. He came to identify with us in the most personal way you can identify with a person, body, and soul. He was born of Mary, and yet he was born of God. So it's amazing the incarnation of Jesus is so profound that he became not only to identify with us, but he dwelt then. He, he hung around for a while, 30 years before he started his ministry, and then three and a half years after that in his ministry, for 33 and a half years. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So grace, we know grace through Him. Truth, we know truth through Him. The truth is this Word right here. It's His Word. He was the Word. He gave us the Word. We live the Word because of Him living in us. And we are blessed because of Him in our lives today. In verse 15, John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Sounds like a riddle. And I'm sure it seemed like one at first until one experienced the one who came and gave his life for the sins of the world. In verse 16, out of His fullness we have all received grace and place of grace already given. But God has always given a certain grace to His people. But this was the fullness of grace in Jesus. For the law is, was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In verse 18, no one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is Himself God and is the, in closest relationship with the Father and has made him known to us. He said to his disciples then, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so when we see Jesus today in our lives, we've seen the Father and the Holy Spirit in our lives today. Over in uh, 1 John 5, John again, it, toward the end of his ministry, concluded how important the incarnation was of Jesus uh, in a Christian's life and in anybody's life because Christianity through Christ is only meant to be a blessing to people the creation of which Jesus is the creator and he has given us an intimate relationship with himself through his death and his resurrection so that he even leave, lives in us today so in 1 John 5 and verse 1, we see John say this. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So the amazing thing about it is, is that Jesus came to identify with us. And so since he did and then died on the cross and was raised from the dead, now we get to identify with him in the spirit. He identified with us in the flesh. And now we get to identify with him in the spirit. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. In verse 2, this is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. So if we say to someone we love them, and then we follow Jesus and carry out his commands, which is to, which is to love all people, well then that is true. It, it's real. It, it means everything. It has the backing of God behind it. Verse 3, in fact, this is love for God, to keep His commands, and His commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So if a politician believes that Jesus is the Son of God, then they participate in that. If politician doesn't believe in the Son of God, then that isn't accomplished. 
and we're just uh, blowing in the wind. So if we want truth, we have to be with the one who gives us truth, and that is Jesus. He is all truth to us and the world. In verse 6, this is the one who came by water and blood, <clears throat> Jesus Christ. So he, he came through the physical birth from a woman into the world. The water broke, the blood was connected to her blood system, and was released when he was born, and he was a human being fully flesh and yet fully God. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which He has given about His Son. So we looked at what John the Baptist did at the River Jordan and how he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, behold, the Son of God, when he was being baptized in the River Jordan. And that was a testimony from God through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In verse 10, whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And that's an amazing thing, isn't it? That we would do that. And yet, without the Father calling us to the Son, we can't go. So we need to pray for people who have not yet been called to the Father to go to Jesus. And God has given us that responsibility to do that. In verse 11, and this is the testimony, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. And he's talking about, of course, eternal life, which is the most important life to have. Well, before Jesus went to the cross, he prayed in his prayer one specific thing that really stands out to me, and that's over in John 17. So it goes to match up perfectly with 1 John 5 and John 17 we see in Jesus' prayer here in verse 22 <clears throat> John 17 and verse 22 I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one so you see how God has included us in himself now through Jesus giving his life on the cross and his resurrection from the dead so he's praying this as though this has already happened. <clears throat> Verse 23, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity, the God in us and us in God, and then the world will know that you sent me. You see how critical that is to know that God the Father sent His Son because He loves us. But it had to be the incarnation of Jesus fully God and fully man. That you sent me and have loved them, us, even as you have loved me, Jesus. So, God through Jesus loves us as much as He loves Jesus. That's just an incredible love, isn't it? And we are the recipients of that today. That's what Jesus is being born through Mary as a couple, Mary and Joseph, bringing Him into the world rearing him, bringing him to maturity to the point where he was able to be the teacher and then our Savior. Now he's our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. And we're so thankful to have such a merciful, loving High Priest as well. And we recognize because of the Incarnation, we are most blessed. It frees us from anything that burdens us down and gives us freedom to really be thinking of all the ways in which we can express His love to those around us. Now we can be a blessing to others. So at this time of the year, help us, dear Lord Jesus, to be a blessing to others. We thank You, dear God, that You give us the wonderful news You do about Your Son, Your testimony of Him, the fact that He is the incarnate Word of God and child of God. And we are definitely the recipients of that love. We feel blessed. We want to express the blessedness that you've given us to others. So may you and will you help us to express the reconciliation that we have, 
that intimate relationship you've given to us through Jesus. May this be the most blessed time of the year for us because we're focusing on Jesus and you're sending him to us. So we ask and pray your blessing, thanking you for it. And it's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. And all together we say, Amen. Amen.